Hello, and thank you very much for joining me here today for a webcast called People Before Paperwork. I know for some, you've probably come into the webcast just to find out why in the world in 2017 we're even talking about paperwork. Paperwork seems like uh, such an antiquated, uh, old-fashioned term. Uh, but I was recently reminded in a Facebook post about some management training that I did back in the year 2000, and I used the phrase, put people before paperwork. I used it a lot. And that advice, actually, it turns out, made a really big difference to someone named Martha, uh, the person who had pinged me on Facebook. So although I now these days more commonly say people first, I wanted to hearken back to this phrase and and to this ideal. So substitute whatever word is more appropriate for you, people before reports, uh, before dashboards, before numbers, people before processes, even people before profits. And I know that's a hard one to fathom. The reason, though, is simple. You see, you'll never get profits without people. And I, I want to explain that. But first, let me um, just step back here a moment. I, I ought to introduce myself. I'm Deb Calvert. I'm the founder of the Stop Selling and Start Leading Movement, the president of People First Productivity Solutions, and also the founder of the other Bright Talk channel that you'll want to be sure and check out. It's called the Sales Experts Channel. And over there, I, I do a few presentations for sales managers, but also there are 62 other sales experts who are contributing content, and it's all free and easy to access. Now, what I've been doing, I, I do buyer side research, and I've been doing that for over 20 years, working to understand what buyers want from sellers and what it takes for sales organizations to be effective. And you, the sales manager, you have a tremendous role in making your organization and your people more effective. So that's what we're really talking about. I want to point out a couple things for those who are new to Bright Talk. First of all, please note that I will have my social media handle and my email address on every slide. And that's because I, I genuinely want to connect with you. I'd, I'd love to hear your email questions that come up after the session, or for those who are listening later on demand, please feel free to, to send me an email. Let me know what, what else you'd like to talk about. Um, and I would dearly love to connect with you on social media, Twitter, Facebook, Google+, wherever you are. So please reach out, connect with me, and uh, enjoy the ride here as we talk more about putting people before everything else, including paperwork, in your organization. This is the new imperative for sales managers. But I want to start by putting you, the sales manager, you first. As a sales manager, you probably feel squeezed. You're selling. You're selling because you're responsible for the numbers, and you'll do whatever it takes to drive those numbers, including going out and selling it yourself. For many of the sales managers I work with, this is true. And I'm going to say more about why this is a bad idea and why I have it framed here as the one and only thing in red that I strongly encourage you to stop doing. And then take a look at all the things in yellow. This, this is yield. Yellow means yield. And these are places where others could be helping you. They could take some of the workload from you. And I'm talking about others who have more expertise and more time and can help you by contributing to the work that you should be primarily focused on, the work in the green areas. Just a couple of examples I can frame up for you here. Um, you can, in fact, you should be enlisting your human resources team and your entire network in sourcing and screening candidates for any open sales roles that you have. You don't have to do that work all by yourself. And if your time is constrained, think about bringing in a sales coach or a sales trainer, somebody with a, a focus, an ability, some expertise. You'll learn a few things about being more efficient and effective in those roles too. But that will give you more time to do some of the other work, the things in the green area that you need to be able to focus, focus on to, to get the job done. 
your organization, if they are resourcing you, it means that they are also resourcing sales productivity. So let's just keep that in the backdrop here. And I want to continue talking about your role. Your role, like any other manager's role, will evolve over time. It will evolve in passages between each level of responsibility, increasing level of responsibility that you take on. Um, what I'm showing you here, this is a diagram from a book called The Leadership Pipeline, written by Ram Charan, and it pertains to any role, but I think in particular it's something that we need to talk about in sales management because other functions do resource their managers differently, do hold their managers responsible more as managers rather than as frontline contributors. So there are three areas at each passage represented by the places where the, the lines intersect. When you go from managing yourself as a frontline seller to managing others as a sales manager to then managing managers as, let's say, the sales director, at each one of those passages, there are three things that you really need to, to change in the way that you do your work. You need to change the skills that you access, and the, the skill requirements for all three of those le levels are significantly different. You need to, to also change the way that you allocate your time. You will get more yield for the work you do when your time is appropriately allocated. You'll be putting people first and getting more from each of the people who report to you. And you'll be impacting the business when you appropriately focus your time. Appropriately is relative to the, the, the job level, the passage that you've made. And the third area is the value that's placed on your work, the things that others are, are actually wanting you to do and expecting from you, the value that they place on the work you do also changes. Unfortunately, that message gets so blurred in the world of sales management. It gets blurred because you do get pulled in so many directions. You have a variety of constituent groups, a variety of responsibilities, and you end up being scattered in all of these ways so that the line is blurred and it's not clear any longer what is the most high priority, the highest value that's placed on your work. But there are clear pathways. There are some very clear pathways in all three of those areas that if you know what they are, they can help you to be more effective by putting people first. I want to elaborate by showing you some specifics still from that work I mentioned by, by Ram Sharan. So you'll recall the first thing that, that has to happen at a, at a particular passage is that there are different skill requirements. And these skill requirements, showing on the, the chart here, these are relative to the job level that you're in. You've got the managing self, the frontline contributor role. You've got the second level, which is where you are then managing other people. This is as a sales manager, you managing those frontline contributors who report to you, your sales team. And beyond that, you've got a sales director, perhaps a, a general manager role. Each of these has a different level of skill that's required. If you're not progressing, if you are stuck in the previous level, you can't possibly be as effective as you would be in the appropriate column. And I see this all the time as a field coach and a, and a consultant who helps organizations to develop sales productivity strategies. Unfortunately, I see this happening quite often. I see that sales managers who have been rewarded throughout their entire career for being high-achieving sales professionals, they, they sort of get stuck there. They become one-trick ponies, not for any other reason except this one. They're held accountable for selling in their sales management role exactly the same way that they were held responsible for selling in their sales role. Th those roles at the surface, they look really similar. Both of them have a number, a goal to be reached. Both of them involve working with accounts and developing strategies to deliver on a number. And so often, sales managers, without training or 
anyone telling them that there's a different way to go about doing things. They rely on the very same skills that got them where they are today. They rely on the relationship building with customers, for example. Instead of moving over into the second column, the second column where they are getting the same work, in fact, hopefully more of that work of selling done through other people. Now, let's face it. When you inherited a sales team, poof, you're a sales manager, you probably had an inclination to help the people on your team begin to do work the same way that you'd done it because it had made you effective. It's why you got promoted. So you started going out on sales calls with them or coaching them in the office and telling them how many calls to make and how to go about conducting the sales calls so that they would be operating more the same the way that you operated. And if that's the case, then you probably were spending less time on the other bullet points in this column. You, you might not have been thinking about how to motivate them, how to build a culture and set a climate, how to give them uh, feedback and th that was developmental to help them to grow, how to do true sales coaching, which, by the way, is very different from sales modeling or mentoring. Uh, and, and, and if you want to know more about that, I, I have a a whole separate webinar on this channel that you can access about sales coaching and what it really looks like. Uh, maybe you were suddenly one day asked to fill a position, and yet you had no training on how to select people. You don't have the skills in the second column. All you have are the skills that came out of your experience in the first column. So you're trying to cross-apply those, and it's not working as effectively as it could be. Now, please understand, I don't mean this in any way, shape, or form as an indictment of the good work that you do. Most sales managers I know are extremely dedicated and extremely talented and are working very, very hard and yet are frustrated because they aren't getting the results. They aren't making the impact that they want to be making. And this is through no fault of their own because they're doing everything they know to do. And nobody's ever taught them or perhaps even told them that there are these different skills to be accessed. So as we're camping out here in the second column, if you don't feel really solid about your skills in any one of these bullet pointed areas, what you'll want to do is focus on finding ways to, to get these skills. I mentioned the Sales Experts channel, also this channel, the Deb Calvert channel. This is just one place. There are many blogs you could follow. In fact, just this week, there was a list published of the 50 best, I believe it was actually 30 best blogs to follow if you're a sales manager. And it was a great list with some of the, the top researchers and trainers and supporters of, of sales managers that I know. My point is this. There are a lot of resources out there for free. They don't require you to have the backing of your organization to go out there and, and access some of the, the learning that's available. Sure, it, it, it would be nice, and I do think it's important for organizations to appropriately resource their sales managers, but, but don't wait around. You can do some of that work yourself to get the resources and develop the skills that you need. Now, that's skill requirements, and this is a shift. And for those who manage sales managers, you'll see in the third column that there are even more additional skills and additional uh, things that you need to be able to do. And before you can move to column three, you'll want to be sure that you are extremely proficient in column two. Along with the passages and skill requirements, there was also a passage for how your time is allocated. Time allocation is the second part of, of making a passage from frontline contributor, sales professional, to sales manager. And I want to point out that there are six bullet points here. These are six priorities of ways that you should primarily be allocating your time. And you'll notice that a full half of these, the last three of them, are all about giving time to people. I don't think that it would be appropriate to say 
proportionately people deserve half your time because the best sales managers I know, the ones who are the most effective and highest achieving, they give far more than 50% of their time to their people. But the three ways to think about giving time to your direct reports would be, first of all, just, just that, time with them. That's time in field coaching. It's time in one-to-one -one meetings. It's time observing them, building skills with them through things like role play, being available to them instead of your door being closed or being consumed by reports that you're supposed to deliver, being truly there to, to give them your quality time. And it's about setting priorities for them, helping them to understand what the expectations are and how they can go about meeting those priorities and expectations. And of course, communication is a big part of this. It, it, it's not that you said something once in your sales meeting on Monday morning. It's that all week long for that thing that mattered to you, you continually communicated about it. You communicated at a one-to-one -one level. You communicated in a way that was clear for every client and every situation that you encountered. And with your communication, there was ongoing coaching, a thought toward development, uh, a, a way for getting people to be able to do things on their own without you having to do it for them. If you'd like to know more about allocating your time appropriately, there, uh, there's a couple of infographics I attached here. There's an attachments tab with this Bright Talk as well as with, with most Bright Talks where you can just go in and download free resources. And in this case, I want to make these some quick, easy hits. So I gave you an infographic about overall time allocation for managers, and it does apply for sales managers too. And I also then gave you a second attachment. It's a blueprint for one-to-one -one meetings, how to structure your one-to-one -one meetings. And, and if you like what you see there, if it raises your curiosity, um, come on back for another webinar that, that focuses on exactly how to use that. It develops it out a little bit more. The third shift to make. And this, I think, precedes the other two. If you don't make this shift, it becomes much more difficult to justify developing the skills and allocating the time. But what you should know is that the value other people place on your work is different now than it used to be. When you were a frontline contributor, an individual seller, you were measured by your ability to get results. You were measured, and those were sales results, numbers, and you were measured by how you adopted to the company's methodologies and sales processes and how you used the tools and, and the quality of, of your work and your relationships. As a sales manager, you've already mastered, you've already demonstrated your ability to do those things. They matter, but they don't matter as much as the items in the second column. Now the value of your time, the value of, of what you do is actually more measured by how you are able to get results through others, how successful your direct reports are, overall what the team goals are and how you're reaching those, your integrity and your work as a manager. And work as a manager does include developing other people. First and foremost, if there's to be any sustained benefit, you're developing people. The success of others is how you're measured, not just by the number. This, this is one of the places where even at a sales director and, and higher level, I sometimes see people confused. See, sales manager, we look at someone who is a sales manager, and sometimes we look at the first part of their title, sales. And if we look at that part only, we're looking at the numbers, we're looking at the short term, we're looking at grinding out the, the results for today, and you might even be doing this to yourself too. If you're looking at just the short term, sales, then you're not looking at the second part, which is frankly Every bit is important, if not more important, because you are also a manager. And as a manager, the long term requires you to have this people-first focus. 
it can't be just about the numbers. It must be about the longer term if you are to be able to sustain any sort of growth. To make the numbers bigger and to make the numbers more often, the only way you can do that is by developing the people who are out there as frontline sellers. The multiplier effect that you can get is by making each and one of every one of them more successful and that they are happy in their jobs too so they stick around and you're not in that revolving door of constantly hiring and replacing people and interviewing people. So the manager part of your job is the part that's reflected in this second column. Yes, sales results matter, but you alone can't drive all the sales results. What you can do is develop the people who will deliver the sales results in much greater numbers than you can. So how do we get people to do that? How do we put people first so that they are delivering and, and ultimately you're able to deliver what, what's expected of you? You have to acknowledge before you can think about how to do it, you have to acknowledge that your time with people, your skills, your appropriate value placed on your work, all of that has a huge impact on the level of commitment that your sellers will have for the work that they do. This graphic is from the Corporate Leadership Council, and it shows you exactly what your impact is. Make no mistake, the level of commitment each and every seller has to the organization is up to you. And it does take more than a lucrative commission plan to motivate people, to help them to feel committed. Managers impact commitment at an emotional level. And this, this is actually very similar to what we say in sales all the time. Emotion, not logic, drives people's decisions and choices, including choices about how hard they're going to work. Now let me just recap what we've talked about here in the first half before we move into some new items here. To boost emotional commitment and to develop skills that are appropriate to a people-first culture and a sustained commitment, there are certain soft skills that you have to develop. And you have to devote time to not only developing those skills, but to then exhibiting them. And I know many managers, especially sales managers, many of them are never trained in these soft skills, which is a shame because your focus on the emotional commitment of people who report to you, it does make a tremendous difference. It enables you to boost retention levels and enables you to boost performance. And that can never, ever happen if you have scope creep into your job, if you're doing a whole lot of, of job duties that aren't at all about developing people, then you will not be effective long term. So for this to happen, we, we have to address a few myths. Let me start with this one. And there is a whole other webinar about this one because it's a very big topic. We're just going to glaze over it. That is the myth that sellers are purely money motivated. The quote you have on screen is about people overall. So your first reaction when you hear that the association between salary and job satisfaction is very weak, your initial reaction, your gut reaction might be, yeah, but salespeople are different. Sales is all about money. Well, if you feel that way, take a look at some additional information, some additional stats that we can put up here for you. That might have been true once upon a time, but uh, OMG and others have done extensive research around that, and they're finding that it's less than half as many as used to be motiv motivated by money. Fewer than half are now money motivated today in 2017. So now I know your reaction is probably still a yeah, but the best ones, the best salespeople are money motivated. Not so fast. You know, that is simply not true. I'm an example of one. I have, throughout my entire 25-year career, I have been extremely successful in selling anything and everything that I set out to sell. And, and I'm not money motivated. I like money, but it's not my primary driver. 
And then there's a whole generation. I'm at the forefront of that generation, but there are many younger than me, Generation X, who will tell you loud and clear every bit of research says to you they want purpose. They are driven by having a purpose, having a meaning behind the work that they do. And money is somewhere further down that list, even for the salespeople from that generation. Many, many top sellers care about money, but not to the detriment of relationships or job satisfaction or pride in the work that they do. Money is secondary. And when people leave their roles as salespeople, it's not about the money. They don't always go to some other place where they can make more money. And in fact, when they do go someplace where they can make more money, when you peel the onion back and say, what is it that, that caused you to go looking for a place where, where you could make more money? It turns out that there are some drivers that caused them to go looking in the first place that weren't related to the financial aspect at all. They go looking for another job because they don't feel appreciated at work or because, in 70% of the case, they have poor relationships with their managers. They don't feel like their managers are invested in them, so they don't have an emotional commitment, and they go looking for a place where they, they can experience that. So as we're putting some pieces together, back to you, putting people first, people before paperwork, people before lots of other kinds of work that you do, you should know that there are six drivers that, that, that will build workplace morale. And the first three of them on screen now, these are related to your ability to convey a positive outlook. And when the economy was bad, I was in so many sales organizations where sales managers had a very dismal outlook. And seller's response was, you know, I don't feel very confident because my sales manager is not very confident. And I just don't see a lot of vision here because things are just bleak. They don't really think we can make the goals. And I'm not sure that anyone's really showing faith in me. That lack of positivity in a sales manager can be so devastating to an organization. Don't fall into traps like that. This is what your sellers want from you. They want you to inspire confidence. That means you have to go out and get confidence. You'll get that from the skills that you're building and from your ability to, to put people first. And when you have that confidence and you're looking future forward and you're seeing purpose in the work that they do, they want you to communicate that vision to them, and they want to be a part of a shared vision, a part that, that gives them meaning and purpose, and to, to put all those pieces together at an individual level by spending time with people in one-to-one -one meetings and as a coach to them. They want you to show faith in them individually. And you can never do any of this work I've just described. You can't do that by focusing on paperwork, reports, metrics, dashboards, uh, productivity levels, or, or any of the things that might be forefront in your mind if the sales manager piece, of, uh, the sales piece of your title is dominating your focus. The other three factors, I said there were six things that drive uh, people's morale. The other three of them are coming up on screen for you now, and these are the things that cause people to determine whether or not you're invested in them for the long term. And what's really surprising here is that not a lot of sales managers talk about these things with sellers. In fact, we could broaden that statement out. Not a lot of managers talk often enough with their employees, with their direct reports, about these kinds of things, their career prospects, the, the ways that they make a contribution, the opportunities they have for learning and development. That's true across all functional areas. But it tends to be even more true in the sales function. We get caught up in talking so much about the short term, the what have you done for me lately, what are your numbers today, Go out and, and call on, on these people to make these numbers. We get so short-sighted that we're not showing people that higher meaning and purpose. 
We're not showing them how their numbers do make a meaningful contribution beyond their own commission check. We aren't talking, in fact, sometimes we're not giving them any opportunities for learning, development, growth, and, and their future career prospects. In fact, all they know about their future career prospects is that someday, if they work really hard, they might get to be in your seat, working as hard as you are, and it looks like it's not very gratifying. So putting people first includes painting a picture that's a brighter picture of the future, something that they want to be a part of, not something that actually looks bleak and purposeless beyond the number. Recapping this little portion, what people want from their manager, including their sales manager, is they want to be first. They want your confidence, your support, your inspiration. They want you to be focused with them on their own future and the contributions they can make. And that's not entitlement, and that's not selfish. This is just basic human nature. And because they entered into a sales function, changes none of this at all. This is what people want. And I would take it a step further to say this is what people deserve, including you. Now let's come back to this idea of emotional commitment because that may still be a bit puzzling to you. Emotional commitment has a business case behind it. This isn't just about touchy-feely, kumbaya, feel-good stuff. Employee engagement is at the heart of what we're talking about. And I, I did give you a, a, a really cool tool. A lot of people are finding great value in this. It is a checklist you can use to build productivity and to build engagement of your employees. So it's got a dual purpose, and it's a, a customizable tool there in the attachments tab for you. Be sure and download that. When I talk about employee engagement, I'm talking about this definition that you see on screen from the CEB. It is a heightened emotional connection, emotional connection. We know that emotional connection is driven by a manager, so this is on you. A heightened emotional connection that an employee feels toward their organization, and when they feel that, then they're influenced to apply additional discretionary effort to their work. So this is about how that emotional connection pays off. Let me give you some facts and figures to back it up. Here's the business case. The reason that you will want to focus time and energy on engagement is that no matter what you're trying to achieve in your business, to successfully execute on any business strategy, we need engagement. We need people to be engaged and to apply additional discretionary effort backed by emotional commitment. And when we have that, those organizations that, in fact, already enjoy a higher level of employee engagement, they get some great benefits. First among those is that they get 50% higher levels of customer loyalty. And I'll challenge you, for those prospects on your list that you just can't get to, to break away from their current vendor and come to you instead, I challenge you to go look at the level of employee engagement for your competitors. And you'll probably see that they have not only the customer loyalty, but they have retention of their employees that's longer lasting than yours, and they've got emotional commitment on the part of their employees, and they've got a, a, a good thing going on that's probably more of a people-first mindset. Not only do you get customer loyalty, though, when you have higher levels of employee engagement, you're also going to have some, some other business benefits that are pretty high impact. How about this one? How about we know that when employee engagement scores are in place, when they're 21% higher, uh, that's a double-digit growth company versus a single-digit growth company. So if you want to see growth in your company, we know that employee engagement has an impact on that. And when we, when we compare in other studies the top quartile to the bottom quartile of engagement scores, we can track with this and we can see that there's higher profitability, 12% higher profitability in those organizations where engagement scores are higher. So th this is not insignificant. These are some pretty compelling numbers. What I want you to know is that what I'm proposing when I say people before paperwork, I'm, 
I'm not trying to take away from your results, just the contrary, the inverse. What I'm proposing drives better results, results that are longer lasting and more meaningful. There are a lot of skills that go along with this. It all comes down to you, the manager. The number one, I only have time to give you one, the number one most essential skill if you are to put people first is that you master listening. No matter what else you do, if you want to put people first, you have to carve out the time and develop the skills of listening, not just passively with your ears, in fact, not just actively where you engage your brain and you properly process information that you hear, but empathetically. Emotion comes from the heart. If you're going to be able to truly put people first, this means getting to the level where you can understand and empathize and care about and put yourselves into the shoes of the people who report to you. This is the number one skill, the master skill for putting people first. And yes, there are other webinars and other resources that, that we've made available for you about listening empathetically. I just want to encourage you, wherever you are, whatever you're doing when it comes to managing your people, Give yourself a little audit. Think about the amount of time that you're devoting to the people who report to you and the people who are around you. Developing them, coaching them, communicating with them, setting expectations for them, compassionately coming alongside them to support them when they're struggling, that's the work that will be the new imperative for sales managers. It's the work that will attract and retain top talent. It's the work that will lead to customer loyalty and boost your profitability. It's the work that will make you more effective and will recharge you in your day-to-day -day and help you to take next-level steps in your career too. And the reason I can confidently say all of that is that when you have a people-first approach to work, you will experience better sales results, period, no question about it. I've seen it happen. I've been doing this for 11 years, and it, it hasn't failed yet in any organization. So think about if you need any help with this, think about reaching out to me. Here at People First Productivity Solutions, we build organizational strength, including your sales, by putting people first. And we can help you with the tools, the training, the coaching, the consulting, the productivity analysis, to put these pieces together and to make this the culture that you have inside your organization too.